and I'm going to hand it over to William Freeman to talk about Chameleon 20 Basics Using Text-to-Speech. Great. Thank you, Leslie and Aaron. Thank you both so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Chameleon 20. And it's really, it's all about this 2.0 update. So we're going to be looking at the very basics of using the device in light of this most recent update. If you ordered a device uh, recently within the last few months, uh, there's a good chance it came on the 2.0 update. Otherwise, you're going to need to update your device in order for everything to be relevant, because there are, there's going to be a lot of new stuff that we talk about today. Um, we're going to go over that and how to update your device. I And I've got my device right here, and it's plugged into my computer. And I'm going to try at different points to share my audio with you so that you can hear it. But I also encourage you, if you have a Chameleon 20 already, to have it in front of you and to just try following along and making sure, you know, as I'm saying things, trying things out. If you're not on the 2.0 update, you can go ahead and try to update uh, while we're talking. Updating can take a little while, so you, you could end up getting behind though. So really you'd probably be better off just following along and noting when there's differences. Uh, the differences aren't gonna be so dramatic that you get completely lost. Uh, there just will be some some differences. And I'll, I'll try to point out when things are specific to this latest update. So with that said, um, oh, and I should probably introduce myself too. So I'm William Freeman. I'm the Tactile Technology Product Manager. My focus is, is, on, is on Braille, uh, basically where Braille and tactile literacy generally interact with technology. And it's uh, it's an exciting time to be in that position. So Today we're we're gonna we're gonna be talking about device basics. We're gonna just kind of go over the layout of the device, generally how the device works. Then we're gonna talk about updating the unit and how updating works. Uh, then we're gonna talk about text to speech, and then we're gonna get into using three of the most popular apps. So we'll talk about using the editor, using the library, and then using the terminal. With the terminal being how you connect to external devices like your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, whatever it may be. Uh, throughout this PowerPoint, uh, I'm gonna be capitalizing, uh, I've capitalized menu items and hotkeys. But one thing to note is that the Braille display to save space in the menus does not capitalize these things. So like here in the agenda, I've capitalized editor. Uh, on the actual Braille display, it's just editor with a lowercase e. And that's to save space. It's just so you know we don't have to put the capital indicator and have menu items potentially take up more space or go on longer than one line. Uh, it'll just make the menu a little easier to read. But I did want to make that clear, especially for folks that are that are very new. So uh, if you've got any questions at all, I have the chat open, and I'm going to be following along with the chat as best as I can and trying to answer your questions as they come up and as they're relevant. But there's also going to be breaks that are built into the presentation where we'll ask questions like uh, poll questions, multiple choice and such. And that'll be a good chance. If I didn't get to your question during the, se the segment, I'll, I'll answer your question at that time. All right. So let's get into uh, device basics. So right now I've got a picture of the chameleon up on the screen. Uh, you can really clearly see the top of the device, the front edge, and then the right edge. And I'm going to go ahead and describe what is there so that we're all on the same page. We're all orienting uh, ourselves with the device uh, in the same way. So at the very top of the front of the face of the device is the Perkins keyboard. So it's the Perkins style keyboard. You've got your, your six Braille keys, you know, dots one through six. And then those are flanked on either side by dot seven on the left and dot eight on the right. So those are traditionally used for computer Braille, uh, but computer Braille's really fallen out of fashion. It's still available on the on the Chameleon as one of your options, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But for the most part, people don't really use dot seven and dot eight anymore to type Braille so much. They're more used for, so dot seven will tend to be used throughout the chameleon as cancel 
and backspace. So if you're if you're in a in a, in a menu or something, uh, it'll tend to more likely be cancel. And if you're typing, say, some text, that's where it's going to be backspace. Whereas dot eight is going to be enter. So if you're typing some text and you press dot eight, it'll make a new line, and now you can type on that new line. Or if you're in a menu and you want to select something in that menu, uh, you press dot eight to go into that menu item. So as I'm giving instructions, if I say, all right, let's go to the editor and go ahead and enter the editor or go into the editor, that means get to the editor menu item and then press dot eight to go into that menu item. And we're going to talk about the menu structure and all that, but I do find it's one of the things that can, you know, it can intimidate people, especially when they're new, dealing with a linear menu structure. You know, I'm a sighted person, and I think as sighted people, we're used to spatially laid out menus, you know, seeing all of the options all at once. And with Braille displays and with a lot of uh, accessible tech, whether it uses Braille or sound, um, you just, you have to get used to a linear structure and, and getting used to exploring that structure. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into it. So you've got the, the Perkins style keyboard. You've got the dot seven and dot eight at the top. And then below that are your 20 Braille cells with router keys. So you've got the Braille cells and then right above them, those bumps are the router keys. The router keys are how you place your cursor. So if you need to get to uh, cell 10 and you're on cell 20, that's the quickest way to get to cell 10 is find cell 10 and just press that router key right above um, cell 10. And, you know, the main reason there is, yes, you can move your cursor manually, but it can get really laborious trying to move your cursor down that line one cell at a time. And you can also use it to select items. So say you're in a menu and there's two menu options, yes and no. You can just press the cursor router key above yes to select yes. Next, we have below the Braille cells are the space bars. There are two space bars, but they function as a single space bar. So whether you uh, use the one on the left or the one on the right or use both of them, it doesn't matter. They're going to input the same way. That was just done to kind of make the device more ergonomic, and it, it allowed us to reuse the same shaped keys as the uh, Braille keys on the top, and then that saved a, a bit of money. Uh, while retaining functionality. So that's the front of the device. Another important thing to think about when you're using the device uh, on the front here is a lot of the hotkeys use either spacebar and then a braille configuration or dot seven and a braille configuration or dot eight and a braille configuration. So you're going to be using space or dot seven or dot eight with your hotkeys. And we'll go over some different hotkeys uh, today. Um, one thing you might hear, I might slip and say it, so I'll warn you, is they're, they're, they're sometimes called corded, corded commands or chord keys. And that just comes from chords on a piano, where you would hit multiple keys on a piano. You're hitting multiple keys on the Braille display. Uh, and then it's doing the same thing. And I'll try not to say hit. I try not to be violent with my... Uh, technology uh, tips, but uh, old habits are hard to, hard to break. So then on the front edge of the device, um, you've got the thumb keys and the home button. We'll start with the home button because that's one of the most important keys on the display. The home button is that round button in the very front and middle of that front edge. And it's round, it's easy to find, it's right between the two space bars, but just down on the front edge. And the home button, you can think of the home button as your escape hatch. So if you're ever lost or confused, you can just press the home button and it will always take you back to the main menu and allow you to kind of start over and reorient yourself. So the home button is a very useful button. I use it all the time as a quick way to jump around on the display and it can be a really good navigation trick. Um, the thumb keys, so there's four thumb keys, two on, you know, there's the 
the starting from the left, there's the short one and then a longer one, then the home button, then another longer one, and then another short one. And these can be a little confusing. There are tactile markers on these thumb keys. They're a little faint, so you may not you may have a little trouble detecting them at first. But if you ever forget what they are, those tactile markers can remind you of what they are. So the short one on the far left is up. Next to that is left. And there's a, you know, there's a little tactile marker on the first one, you know. So at the very top, that's up. And then in the next one, the tactile marker is on the left. And then when we, we go across the home button, there's a tactile marker on the right, and that one is right. And then uh, the, the one on the far right is down. And again, there's a tactile marker for down. So I'll go through that again real quick. It's up, then left, then the home button, then right, and then down. And really, you don't need to like mess with them all the time. A good way to think about them, like let's just stick to right and down. So we're on the right side, we've got right and we've got down. A good way to think about them is if you have a long line of braille that takes up more space than 20 cells, right will move you to the right on that line, while down is going to skip the rest of that line and go straight to the next line. So if you're reading something and you want to make sure you're not skipping anything, a good habit is to use the right button to go forward in the text and then use the left button to go backwards in the text. Um, up and down are better if you're moving, if you want to move quickly, like if you're trying to find something, if you're trying to find a particular paragraph or a particular menu item, and you don't want to bother reading, you know, all this text that's not important to you. So the main thing is just using uh, left and right to, to kind of navigate. And these are configurable. That's more of an advanced uh, more of an advanced skill, uh, but you can configure the cell, the thumb keys to do different things. A uh, question from a blind person. If I'm helping a sighted teacher, how good is the contrast for reading the cells visually? I read Braille visually, and I find the contrast to be great. The Braille cells are, the Braille dots are white, and then the, the actual backing on the uh, on the, the full cell and the router key is black. So it's white on black. The one place it can be difficult if you are a new Braille reader is there is just a little bit of white when the cell is down, but it's not so much that I find it hard to read. So I would say it is very easy to read the uh, Braille visually. Um, so we've, we've talked about the front face, we've talked about the front edge, and now the right edge. The right edge is very exciting. Uh, it used to not really do anything. And now the right edge is enabled. So if you have the 2.0 update, the right edge is now enabled. So there at the top on the right edge, that's your audio jack. So you can plug in a speaker, you can plug in a headset. Um, you can, like right now, I actually have a uh, double, it's a double audio cable. So it's an audio in with another audio in. And so I, I'm using that to plug it into my computer. And later you're gonna be able to hear my chameleon through this uh, meeting. And that's something you can do with your students when they're remote, uh, you know, for a snow day or something like that. You could ask them to, to do a similar setup and then you could at least hear what they're doing on their braille display. Uh, while they're doing it. Uh, below the audio jack are the volume up and down buttons. And those give a nice little beep uh, to let you know uh, kind of what audio to expect. And then below that, and you can almost miss it, there's just this little indention in the display. And it's there's actually two. One is, one is for uh, venting, I think. And then one is the actual speaker. So the longer, thinner one is the speaker, and then the the shorter the shorter one is is just for uh, ventilation on the device. Um, the th the big thing, the main reason I mentioned this speaker is it could be very easy to cover up, uh, you know, with your hands, 
if you and if you were relying on audio you'd want to be mindful that the speaker was there and that you didn't cover it up with your hands um, got another question in the chat this is a great question very on topic can you connect a bluetooth headset you cannot connect a bluetooth headset at this time uh, that's something we're looking into uh, it's something we want you to be able to do uh, but we're still exploring uh, how complicated it's going to be and also we want to make sure it doesn't interfere with um uh doesn't interfere with uh when you connect to a device via terminal via the terminal app um it's not pictured but i'll talk briefly about the left edge of the device so at the top of the left edge of the device is the usb-c port the usb-c port is how you charge the device and it's also how you connect to a computer. So if you want to connect to a computer, whether a Windows machine or a Mac or a Chromebook, uh, you'll use that USB-C. You'll need a USB-C to either a, a USB-C on the other end or a USB-A. USB-A is going to be a lot more common with older devices. USB-C is going to be more common with newer devices. Um, that's something you can probably, you know, work out with your tech department if you have any issues there. But that is, it's the USB-C that you use to connect to an external device. And that's for either using it with a screen reader or using it as a storage device. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, below that is the power button. You know, you can tap it once to put the device to sleep. You can press and hold it to power off the device. And then below that is the USB-A. The USB-A is for thumb drives. So if you have a thumb drive and you want to transfer something to the device or you want to transfer something from the device to the thumb drive, that's where you'll plug the thumb drive in. The device has 16 gigs of onboard storage, and you can use a thumb drive up to 64 gigs. Along the top edge is the slot for the SD card. You can feel it if you run your finger along the top edge. And again, with the SD card, that's another 64 gigs of external storage. Now, one thing I will tell you is the device will run slower if you put a ton of books on it. So the, the device, when you access the library, when you access the file manager, when you access the editor, at all these different points, the device has to check in with your external external storage and see how many books you have there. So I would caution against putting, you know, I would, even though you can potentially have 128 gigs of external storage, that's a ton, a ton of books. I mean, that's the Library of Alexandria uh, worth of books. I would caution against doing that because it will cause your device to run a little bit slower all the time. Uh, and it will continue to happen. It's something we're looking into, like a way we could catalog it, so maybe it checks less often. Uh, but for right now, I would just I would only put on there what you need to put on there, and maybe keep it below a reasonable fifty books or so. Um, but that's those that's all you need to know about the storage. And I see we do have some questions coming in. Um, you can connect standard headphones into the headphone jack. Um, we're working on wireless headphones. And we're all, you know, once we have Bluetooth connectivity for the speakers, you'll be able to do a speaker, you'll be able to do headphones, you'll be able to do whatever you want. Uh, for right now, you can connect anything wired. That is a, you know, anything that's got this same, you know, standard audio jack capabilities you can connect it. So a Bose speaker, uh, regular headphones, whatever it is. We use regular, uh, we use a nice speaker when we go to conferences. And then I use headphones when I'm at home. Uh, so I don't bother anyone else. So yeah, you've got a few options. And as far as voices, we'll get into the voices when we talk about um, speech a little bit more. And then as far as average battery life, uh, you can comfortably get 15 hours of average battery life. It's going to go up or down based on how you're using the device. Um, using speech a lot is going to definitely impact the the device, um, you know, to less battery life. But 15 is a is a really comfortable number. It's actually better than that, but we feel really comfortable saying 15. How fast does it charge up again? Um, it charges up quickly. 
I haven't actually timed it in a long time. Uh, you're going to want to definitely keep your the charger that comes with the device. Uh, it'll charge faster with that than it will with uh, with another charger, and it's easier to bring it back from from a low charge with that. Um, but it does charge relatively quickly. I would say three or four hours um, is a high estimate. And then as far as last question here, replacing the keys if they get damaged. Um, replacing the keys, you'll need to contact APH customer service and initiate a repair. Uh, the keys are not I've, I've not really heard about the keys popping off and I've been really rough with my display. I take it everywhere I go. I take it back and forth to work. I take it on planes and I just throw it in my bag. I don't even think about it. And my keys have never popped off or had any problems. All right. So let's get into the menu structure. So the menu I'll just run through the different apps real quick. So we've got the editor and we've got the Braille editor. These are two distinct apps, okay? But they do basically the same stuff. We're gonna cover the editor today. The Braille editor does everything that the editor does, except it only opens Braille files. So when you open a file in the editor, uh, if you open a BRF or a BRL in the editor, it back translates it into print, and then you save it. If you edit it, it'll save it as a text file. Um, with the Braille editor, you open it up, it keeps it as Braille, you save it, it saves as a BRF. So that's the primary difference between those two apps. And we are going to do a deeper dive into the editor today. The terminal, that's a scary name for an app. Um, what it does is it connects to other devices. So that's the app you're going to use to connect to a phone, to an iPad, to a Chromebook, to your computer whatever it might be. And we're going to do a deep dive on that app today as well. The library, uh, it opens files for reading. And we're going to do a deep dive on the library today. The next app is the file manager. The file manager does basic file management. You can manage your files using the file manager. It does everything you need it to do. However, I would recommend plugging in a USB-C cable and connecting the device to your, your PC or your Mac, and then managing your files that way. Because that'll be the way you're most familiar with. It'll be the way your students probably most familiar with. You can create folders. You can move folders. You can move items. You can delete. You can create. You can do everything you can do on Windows uh, or Mac through those interfaces. And it'll be it'll those updates will happen on the device. So that's what I would recommend for the majority of your file management. If you've just got a quick moving this from here to there, go ahead and do it on the device. But if you're moving a ton of stuff back and forth, if you really wanna do some major file organization, I would connect it to an external device, PC or Mac, and then do it that way. Uh, calculator, that's obvious, basic computations. Uh, date and time. The main thing with date and time is this is where you set the date and time, and then there are hotkeys you can use throughout the device to access the date and time. So the main thing about that app is it's where you set the date and time. Um, settings, we're not gonna have time. There's a ton of stuff you can do in settings. This device is meant for adults in the workplace. It's meant for students, you know, very young, middle school, high school, college, university. You know, it's meant for such a large group of people of all different walks of life, you know? So there's a ton of things you can configure, and we're not going to have time to get into every single thing that you can change. I would really encourage you after this webinar to get into the settings, explore those, and try different things out. You're not going to break the device by messing around with these settings. Uh, that's why they're there. Uh, and you can also use the user guide to explore the uh, settings some more. Um, next, we've got online services. This is how you access NFB Newsline and Bookshare services. So you can log in, you can download books, you can check out magazines if you have access, you know, you have an account for those services. Uh, we don't have time to get into it today, but there is a whole series of Mantis videos that covers a lot of these topics. And basically everything from those Mantis videos can be used with the, uh, 
the chameleon, especially when it comes to online services. So be sure to check those out. Um, the user guide, uh, that's going to be, it's going to have the latest user guide for the version that you are on. And then finally, we have power off. Uh, you can use this menu item, but you can also just hold the power button on the left edge of the unit. Uh, one thing about navigating, so you can navigate using the thumb keys. So you can move through and you can press dot eight to go into an app. Uh, but you can also use first letter navigation. So if you know you need to go to the file manager, uh, you can just type F on your Braille keyboard and it'll jump you to the file manager. And, you know, if there's two items with the same first letter and you need to go to the second one, then you can press that same letter twice. Uh, if your menu structure is different than mine, like if you're not seeing the Braille editor, for example, the Braille editor was added in the 2.0 update and so that means you're on a previous update and you will need to upgrade. We're going to talk about updating here in a moment. So the last thing about navigating the menus is a very important hotkey, which is space plus E. So you use dot eight to enter an app, and then you use space plus E to exit an app or to go back up a level if you're deep inside the menu structure. So space plus E is a very important hotkey to remember because that's how you exit things. And that'll help you navigate the different apps. The other really important hotkey is the context menu hotkey. It is space plus M, space plus M. So that's dot one, dot three, and dot four to make an M. It works in most apps. It doesn't work in the main menu yet, we have plans to make it work in the menu in a future up the main menu in the future update, but don't worry about it if it doesn't work. You just get a little beep and nothing bad happens. So if you're ever like lost and confused and you're not sure what to do, just press space plus M and then that will activate the context menu if it's available and it is available in most apps and that'll show you what is possible within that app. So in the editor, it'll show you how to open files. It'll show you how to save, you know, all different apps. And it, it's not only giving you the options to do the things that you want to do, it's teaching you the hotkeys for those. So you can use the context menu to learn the hotkey. And then once you've got the hotkey down, you can stop using the context menu for that, that particular action and just use the, the hotkey particular to the action you're trying to do. So space plus M is a very, very important hotkey and use it through all throughout the device and it'll teach you everything you really need to know. Another like regular use hotkey is the braille grade. So on the device, you've got three different braille grades by default. You've got uncontracted, contracted and computer. Um, you set those by going to settings Lang and then once you're in settings, language profile, and then configure profile, and then you'll select your profile. By default, your device is going to come with one profile called English, and that'll be your default profile. You can select that when you select configure profile. And then this is a really intimidating part of the device because you've got the type of profile. So is it an uncontracted profile or a contracted profile? You've got the different Braille grades. So you've got to pick a table for uncontracted and a table for contracted and a table for computer. It can be really intimidating because there's a lot of different uh, tables that you can select. But the main thing you'd want to know about this part, you've already got the best tables selected. You're already set for the Duxbury tables. We also have LibLouie tables, and those are very good. But you're already set for the Duxbury. So you don't really need to change anything. But one cool trick that you can do is you can go in and you can set your computer Braille table to none. That's one of the options, set it to none. Uh, and then when you use this hotkey backspace plus G, so dot seven plus G, uh, it'll only switch between uncontracted and contracted. So instead of skipping, you know, uncontracted, contracted computer, and then looping back around, 
you'll just be able to skip from uncontracted to contracted, uncontracted to contracted. It makes it a lot easier for the student to know what's what's happening and it'll help them find words that are uh, uncon, you know, new contractions. They can go back and see what the word looks like in an uncontracted form. So that's a tip. And you can do that with any table. You can set any table to none, um, but the most useful one is the computer braille table since that code is not really used as much as it used to be. It's actually no longer officially a code, uh, though people still use it. So that's just some basics. Um, we're now gonna get into updating the unit. We did get one other question, which is does this work with Chromebooks? And yes, the, the device does work with Chromebooks. Uh, it's via USB only. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and we have another question. Uh, will this PowerPoint be available after the meeting? Uh, yes, the PowerPoint will be available and uh, there also will be, you'll be able to rewatch this video. It'll take us a little while to get it posted, but this video will be posted and you can watch it anytime that you want. So don't worry if you're not quite able to take notes as fast as you want. And uh, I'll try to slow it down uh, so I'm not going so fast. All right. So next we will talk about updating the unit. So you will want to update your unit uh, to the 2.0 update. You'll want to keep your device up to date. Uh, we're always getting feedback from users. So from students, from teachers, from adults that use the device. And we're responding to these. And that is what's driving our priorities. So please update your units because uh, we're adding the things that we think that you want based on what you're telling us. And so there's three ways to update the unit. Uh, you can automatically install updates detected by a Wi-Fi connected unit. You can manually check for updates using a Wi-Fi connected unit. So very similar to the first method, but just slightly manual. And then finally, the third most manual method is manually installing an update after downloading it from APH.org. So we're going to get into each of these but we'll start by just talking about connecting to Wi-Fi. So the process for connecting to Wi-Fi, it can be a little intimidating. Um, you'll start by going to settings in the main menu. And then once you're in settings, go to Wi-Fi. So a quick way to do that is you just press the home button, jumps you back to the editor, type S to get to settings, press dot eight, and then type W to get to Wi-Fi and press dot eight. And then now you're in the Wi-Fi. By default, Wi-Fi is going to be off. So press dot eight. You know, the first thing it'll say is Wi-Fi off. So press dot eight to turn Wi-Fi on. And then using your thumb keys or using, you know, first letter navigation, go to new connection. And that'll bring up a whole nother list of options. And the very first one is scan for SSID. So SSID if you're not uh, familiar with that term, that is the name of your Wi-Fi network. So you'll hit enter, it'll scan the local environment looking for available Wi-Fi networks. The first one should be yours because typically your network will be stronger than any other competing networks. But if not, you can use your thumb keys to search through and find your network and then press dot eight. And then that will bring you to the password field. Now, the password field is a place that can be complicated for folks. And part of why it's complicated is it uses your current Braille code. So my Wi-Fi password, uh, I feel comfortable. I'm among friends, so I can share this. Uh, it is entirely numeric. And so what I do when I put in my Wi-Fi password is I just put number sign, and then I use the UEB numbers, so upper cell numbers, and then I press enter, and then I connect every time. People get mixed up though, because if your password is a mix of letters and numbers, it can get a little complicated to enter. If your Wi-Fi password is a mix of letters and numbers, um, then that's where you'll wanna maybe, that's where it's most useful to have computer braille. So you might switch to your computer braille table and then that way you don't have to worry about number signs. You don't have to worry about grade one indicators or anything like that. You can just type letters in the upper cell, numbers in the lower cell, and then press enter, you'll connect, and then you can leave computer braille and hopefully not have to go back to it. 
uh, except for in the calculator. So that's really the most important or the most difficult part is inputting your password. There is an easier connection method, which is the WPS connection method. Now, the thing about WPS, uh, system admins, tech people, your IT department, they don't like WPS connection methods. Um, there's a little button on your router. You can press that, and then that will initiate a WPS connection on your router. And then you've got like five minutes uh, to, to initiate it on your chameleon. So you would go from the Wi-Fi menu, go to new connection, you'd select WPS connection and press enter. And basically what happens is your router starts saying, basically, I'm ready to connect, I'm ready to connect for five minutes. And your chameleon will say, I'm ready to connect, I'm ready to connect. And if they, they catch each other, which they will, if they're relatively close to each other, they'll, they'll catch each other and then they'll just connect. Uh, system admins and those kinds of folks don't like this method because if, you, if there's a bad actor, like a bad person that wants to connect to your network and they happen to detect that you've made that available, they can then connect to your network. Um, but talk to your, your sysadmin, your IT folks, and see if this is something that they're willing to do. And it is, it is an option and it is the easiest option to connect a uh, device uh, for Wi-Fi. Uh, once you're connected, the device should automatically detect when an update is available and alert you. So you shouldn't really have to do anything from that point. Uh, it'll detect there's an update. It'll ask, would you like to download the update? Uh, and you just say yes. And then once it's downloaded the update, it'll say, would you like to install the update? And then it'll, uh, you just say yes. And then it'll, it'll, it'll t take it from there. Uh, a key thing is you must have at least 50% battery and be connected to a power source in order to install the update. So 50% battery and connected to a power source to install the update. Um, so that, that's really the easiest method. If you don't trust that method or if you're having issues, if you're connected to Wi-Fi, you can go to settings and then software update. And then there's an option check for update. And so this will, this will automatically, this will go out and then see is there an update available and it'll come back and tell you. So that's another method. The last method is a great method if you're not connected to Wi-Fi or if your Wi-Fi is really slow. Um, if your Wi-Fi is really slow, there actually can be a problem where the update will time out, the server will time out and you won't really be able to update via Wi-Fi. So this can be a good method for folks that, are, have, that have that issue as well. So you can just go to um, the APH website so aph.org slash chameleon dash 20, uh, well, aph.org slash product slash chameleon dash 20. And that's the chameleon shop page. And then from there under downloads is the braille reader software update. That'll always, always, always be the latest version available for the chameleon. So you, this is a place you can always go to and always find the latest. You just download that. It works whether you're on a Mac, a Windows, whatever you're on, you can download this file. Uh, it's a zipped folder, so you'll just unzip it. Inside that folder is an SWU file. This SWU file, that's your update file. Put that on a thumb drive or an SD card. You want to put it at what's called the root of the thumb drive or SD card. Root just means not inside a folder. So it, you can't put it inside a folder just put it on the thumb drive or SD card, not inside a folder. And then insert the thumb drive or SD card into your chameleon, turn it on, it'll detect that there's an update and then just follow the instructions from there. Um, it's an easy method. And if you're in a school system, as a lot of you said you are from the survey, um, it's the method I would recommend for updating a lot of chameleons like if you have to update a bunch of chameleons for a bunch of students, um, it you can download the update once, put it on a thumb drive, plug it into the first chameleon, get it updated, and then unplug it before it turns back on. If you leave it in, when it turns back on, it deletes the update. It thinks it's doing you a favor, but for the particular use case I'm talking about now, it's not doing you a favor. So update it, and then when it's done, unplug it before you turn the chameleon on, and then plug it into your next chameleon or your mantis or whatever, and go ahead and update that one. 
Um, you could also download it once and put it on a bunch of different SD cards and get a bunch of units updating all at once. So a few options there um, to talk about. And then that brings us to our first poll question. Uh, Aaron, would you be able to launch that, please? And then I'll start answering questions in the chat. That is launch. Thank you. So this is, the chameleon requires how much battery to install an update? Uh, this is multiple choice. Your options are 10%, 25%, 50%, and 100%. So I hope folks will take that poll. And then I've got a question about uh, where and when does Backspace G work? Do I have to be in a specific menu or document? It doesn't seem to work in the... It's working for me just in the main menu. So I'm not sure why it's not working for you. You do want to be doing Backspace plus G. Oh, if it's not updated, it seems to need space with Backspace plus G. Um, that's a good point. That's something that I'm, I can't quite remember personally. So I'm sorry about that. It's, I've been on 2.0 for a, lot, a long time. Uh, so I don't remember what it was like before. Um, but you try it with space and... It, oh, and if you're having some trouble, so we've got someone who's having some trouble doing a... a an update, uh, one of the things is you can reach out to, so send an email to outreach at aph.org and they can connect with you and help you with that process. So send an email to outreach at aph.org. So yeah, thank you for asking that question. Uh, so it reminded me to, to make sure that was available to folks. All right, have we had folks um, Answering the poll question, are we ready to share the results there? We um, are up to 63%. That sounds good to me. Um, okay. the, the correct answer is 50%. So it requires 50% uh, battery to install an update. We had 79% of our attendees say 50%. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we do have another question. How do I enter number signs in the password for a Wi-Fi connection? So if you're set for contracted or uncontracted Braille, you just do the number signs. So dot four, uh, dot three, four, five, six, and then type the numbers in the upper cell. And that, that's how you do numbers. If you're having trouble because you're having to switch back and forth between numbers and letters, that's a really good time to switch to computer Braille uh, because then you don't need the number sign. You can just do lower, lower cells for numbers, upper cells for uh, letters. All right, one second. And now we'll talk about text-to-speech. So if you're on the 2.0 update, text-to-speech is enabled by default. And to configure text-to-speech settings, you go to settings and then speech settings. So from the main menu, S to get to settings. And then I think it's S again, maybe S twice to get to speech settings. Uh, but it's easy enough to find in the settings menu. The most confusing thing about speech is that there are two voices. There's a system voice and a content voice. And we're going to talk about those first because it is a, it is a bit confusing. There's a method to the madness, but but there it is a bit confusing. So system voice versus content voice. The system voice handles speaking menu items, so editor, library, online library. So basically, just reading items in the menu, reading items in the settings menu, that sort of thing, and that is set under speech settings. So go to settings, then speech settings and then voice selection. And then content voice handles speaking content in the library and the editor. Uh, and that is found under settings language profile. We talked about language profile a bit ago. We talked about how you have the different, you know, uncontracted tables, contracted tables, and the computer braille table, and how you could set computer braille for none when you don't need it. 
that's also where you're going to set your content voice. And th so this is a little confusing. And for most users, you'll probably want the same voice, whether it's the system or the content voice. Um, but there's there are special use cases, especially you know now that the Chameleon supports Spanish. There's three voices that are available right now. There's Rosa, there's Will, and there is uh, Sharona. So Sharona and Will are both English voices. Rosa is the Spanish voice. So that'll read Spanish the way it's meant to be pronounced. So kind of the thinking there is your content voice is tied to your language. And so that makes it easier if, you, if you're someone who has to switch from English to Spanish, that way you can have a voice that matches the language as your language switches. So let's talk a little bit about, so setting system voice. Um, when you se select your system voice, it'll let you pick from your available voices. Uh, by default, it's gonna be Will and Sharona, but you can also pick Rosa. Um, if you would like to use Rosa, then select Rosa first under the option for additional voice and then let the device reset. This part is a little confusing and weird. Part of why this happens is because we have to pay for the licensing for these voices. We have to pay per unit per voice. And uh, we're putting three voices on there, but we can only make two voices easily available. And so that's why anytime you switch between the, the voices that are available, you have to restart the device. We had to make it a little bit hard to switch between voices to, to keep the expenses down on switching between voices. So that's what's going on there. I hope I'm not confusing folks too much, but um, for most people, you're gonna be fine with the default. If you need to switch to Rosa, uh, you do it under this voice selection menu and you start by setting it as your additional voice and then resetting your device. Now, content voice. Content voice, you're, you're only going to be able to choose between the voices that you set under voice selection. So if you want to use Rosa as your content voice, you've got to set it first and then you can go set your content voice later. And that's going to be done, like we said, under settings, language profile, configure profile. So set the, the profile you'd like to configure, go down to the option, change content voice. It lets you pick between those two options. When you're done, you can then select save configuration. So this is kind of the most confusing part. I think most people are gonna be fine with the defaults. Uh, if you run into trouble, you know, we're happy to help and I'll also put my own email in the chat, which is wfreeman at aph.org. So feel free to reach out to me with any questions or feedback that you might have. Now, speech settings, there's a lot of speech settings. And the main thing here is that you can, you can, you can have as much speech or as little speech as you want. So speech on or off, speak menus on or off, speak word under cursor, on or off. Speak word under cursor is my favorite one. You could turn everything off, but leave this option on. And then that way you're, you're not getting bombarded with speech all the time and maybe getting distracted. You can focus on the braille. But then if you come across a braille word that you don't know, you just press that router key and now you are uh, hearing that word and it's going to help you learn new braille contractions. Um, next is speak display content after panning. Again, on or off, echo delete. So as you delete words, it'll echo them back to you on or off. And then keyboard echo. Keyboard echo it has a few options. So words, characters, characters and words, and then off. So it'll either, as you type a word, it'll either read the whole word, just each character or both or nothing. And then finally, the voice selection, which we've talked about. This is where you set the two main voices that are going to be available to you. And if you change those, you have to restart your device. Important speech hotkeys. Um, read all is space plus G. So that'll just start reading from the current cursor location. It'll read everything in a document. Stop reading is a very important hotkey if you need it to shut up. That's your dot seven and your dot eight. So backspace plus enter will stop it reading. 
If you need it to read faster, that's going to be enter plus dot five. And then similarly, if you need it to read slower, it's enter plus dot two. A really, really important hotkey is space plus previous thumb key. So that's also known as the up key. And that is the key on the far space left. On. So I just pressed mine to turn it back on. I've had mine off this whole time. Off. And editor. And now it's talking some more as I've I've navigated to the back to the editor. But those are your hotkeys. And that is the Sharona voice. I'll do enter dot five to speed it up so you can hear that. Speed two. Speed three. Speed four. Speed five. And so you can make it go much faster. And I know uh, adept uh, sound users are probably going to want it to go faster, uh, whereas people that don't use speech a lot are probably going to want it to go slower. And so now we're up to our next question. Uh, could we launch that next poll question, please? Sure, there it is. Thanks. So this is true or false. The content voice is set under language profile. Your options are true or false. We won't linger on this question too long to make sure we don't run out of time. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat as well. I think we're caught up for the moment. Have folks had a chance to? We are just about to 50%, but we have an overwhelming amount, 73% that have answered, have answered true. Yes, and the answer is true. So content voice is set under language profile. All right. So yeah, we'll go ahead and close that and move on so we don't run out of time. We are getting dangerously close. Um, yeah, if you haven't updated, the device will not talk. So you will need to update to 2.0 in order to get the device to talk. So now we'll talk about using the editor. So the editor opens um, different file types. So docx and doc, those are word file types. So new word is docx, old word is doc, um, txt, PDF, and various Braille file types. I say various because it opens a lot of international Braille file types that you've probably never heard of and you don't need to worry about, but it opens BRF and BRL, uh, the two most common uh, Braille file types in North America. So Word, TXT, PDF, and then BRF and BRL. Everything you edit or create gets saved as a TXT file. Now this is important because the file size limitations uh, come from this idea. So if it's a print file type, Word, P, uh, text, so forth, it's going to be a 2,000 kilobyte limit, which is a pretty big file type. Um, but with Braille, it's smaller because it's based on the number of characters. And that's because we're having to back translate the Braille back to print. And so your limit is 221,000 characters, which does end up being smaller than print files. The existence of the Braille editor solves this problem somewhat because now you can open them in the Braille editor where the file, you know, it's not as strict because it's not having to back translate. Uh, but that's just something to be aware of. Another cool thing about the editor is it now has bookmarks. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're removing some of the differences between the editor and the library uh, and kind of making them, you know, working on making them one app so that it's just a little bit easier to work with stuff. Uh, and part of that's adding some of the same features to the editor that the library had and vice versa for the library. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And we'll talk about bookmarks a bit more later. Uh, by default, the editor is going to want to pull from the documents folder. So you've got a documents folder and a books folder. The editor is going to want to pull from documents. The library is going to want to pull from books. You can change where it's pulling from, um, just you know, from within the menus. But just be aware that that's kind of where it's going to default to. 
uh, and that'll help you keep track of these are my documents, these are my books. You've also got an online library folder, and that's for Bookshare and NFB uh, Newsline. Some important uh, editor hotkeys are find and find and replace. Um, so find is space plus F. Find and replace is backspace plus F. Now, a key thing here is if your table is contracted, your current table is contracted, you can use either contracted or uncontracted Braille to find something. Um, so let's say you want to find the word and. You could type A and D, or you could use the, you know, the, the, the contracted form of and, the dot one, two, three, uh, four, six uh and and it'll find it either way but if you're contracted if you're currently uncontracted you can only use uncontracted braille in the find or find and replace so that's just an important thing to keep in mind uh if you're uncontracted and you try using the uncontracted uh or the contracted word it won't find it um so just something to be aware of the next thing is next and previous Next and previous are going to be used with find and find and replace. So the next is space plus in, previous is space plus p. Now, if you're using find, you know, they'll just find the next word. So next, 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 it'll just jump from instances of that word. And so it's a good way to navigate within a file, especially a file that doesn't have a lot of formatting. And so you can't use the other, the other methods. Uh, to move through the file. Um, find and replace, it's not just when you use next, it's going to find the next instance of that word and replace it. So you want to be careful. You could get into a dangerous situation where you've done find and replace and it's replaced something you didn't mean it to. So you'll just want to be careful with your searches and your replaces when using the next and previous buttons. Um, if it's not a super big file, you might go through and do find first and make sure, yeah, I do want to replace all these. And then you can use either find and replace uh, with next and previous, or you could use the replace all button. But the find and replace is a very good way to work with files in the editor to get a lot of changes done quickly and efficiently. Another common use uh, in the editor is cut, copy, and paste. These hotkeys should be familiar to you because they're based on the same hotkeys that you'll be familiar with when you use like a PC. So instead of control, you're using backspace. So the hotkey for cut is backspace plus X. The hotkey for copy is backspace, backspace plus Y. And then paste is backspace plus V. So X, Y, and V, you know, control X, control Y, control V. So these should all be uh, familiar. Um, the key difference is start and stop selection. So you don't have a mouse. I'm sure if you use cut, copy, and paste, you're used to using your mouse to highlight the text and select it with your mouse if you're a mouse user. Or you use your keyboard if you're not a mouse user. Well, with the chameleon, you're going to want to put your cursor where you want selection to start. And then you use the hotkey Enter plus S. And then that sets that start selection. Then you move your cursor. So navigate using the thumb keys, move through the file however you want to. You know, thumb keys are probably going to be the most common way you'd move. And then put your cursor where you want selection to end. So using those router keys we talked about. And then use enter plus S again. And that will end your selection. So once you've ended your selection, you've started it and you've stopped it. Then you use cut, copy, and paste, or you know, cut and copy, to cut or copy that selected text. And then you can paste it. So the start and stop selection, I think, is the thing that's going to be most unfamiliar to folks. And, and that's how it is done. It's setting your cursor, using the hotkey, setting the cursor again, and then using the hotkey again. If you put your, let's say you go backwards, it'll then select everything from that point backwards. So you can also go backwards or forwards. It's up to you. Next is uh, bookmarks. So the bookmark menu is enter plus M. That gives you all the options that are available 
for uh, setting a bookmark. And so it's a good place to start. You can also find it in the context menu uh, for the editor. Um, and you can also enter a bookmark. You can completely bypass the bookmark menu using enter plus B, and then that will insert a bookmark at your current location. Now, bookmarks are numbered between one and 98. A bookmark number will automatically be assigned. So if you've never entered a bookmark before, it'll the first one you enter, it'll want to make it bookmark one. You can override it. You can tell it to make it a three or a 33 or whatever you want to make it. Um, but it will start automatically numbering from one. Um, now here's where it gets dangerous. If you enter a bookmark number of 99, it will delete all your bookmarks. Uh, it's just a quick way to delete bookmarks. Uh, but I could imagine it could be very frustrating if you'd entered 99 by accident uh, and pressed enter and not realizing what it would do and it would delete all your bookmarks. So you wanna be careful there. Once you've entered your bookmarks, you can use enter plus J to jump to a bookmark. So enter plus J and that'll jump you and you'll, you'll get a chance. It'll ask you what bookmark you wanna to go to. And that's where it's helpful to remember uh, your different bookmark numbers. Uh, we're going to talk about advanced navigation here in just a little bit. Uh, and you can also use advanced navigation to just jump from bookmark to bookmark. But we'll get into that in just a moment. The next thing is read mode. So read mode allows you to read files in the editor without the risk of accidentally editing content. That hotkey is space plus X. So you're in the editor. You're pretty sure you're done editing, but you're not sure yet. Just do space plus X, that'll let you read. You don't have to worry about accidentally hitting a key and potentially adding Braille to your file. Uh, and you can then deactivate it with the same key, space plus X. Now, another quick thing is a new option in the 2.0 update is that you can go under the, the editor's main menu, but also in the context menu. And there's this option removed to, to toggle text indicators. These are the brackets that are at the beginning and end of your file, and this will remove them. So it doesn't really change the functionality. It just gets those brackets out of the way and gives you more room uh, for editing Braille on your Braille display. Just a quick little tip uh, to let folks know that that is a new thing that you can do. And you know we talked about the Braille editor a bit, um, but I'll go ahead and mention everything we've just gone over is also applicable to the Braille editor. The main difference is the, the Braille editor is only for Braille files. So BRFs and BRLs, and it saves everything as a BRF. And then the other key thing here is text to speech is not possible in the Braille editor. It's because it just has Braille uh, and it, it can't make words from the Braille. It's something we're look, looking at. We could potentially back translate to, to make words and then speak those, but I don't know, I don't know how much work that's gonna be and if it'll be worth the effort involved. But that brings us to our editor question. Uh, Aaron, could we please launch this editor question? It is launched. Thank you. So the editor wants to pull from the blank folder. And you get a single choice here. Your options are online hyphen books, documents, books, or release notes. Those are the four folders available on your device by default. Which one does the editor want to pull from? And if there's any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. And Aaron, if you could let me know when we've gotten more than 50% of folks responding to the question. Okay, we're close, not quite there, but close. What's the most popular answer? Uh, by 96%, the most popular answer is documents. And that is, that is the correct answer. So this can be helpful if you're your students confused about where their documents are being saved or where they're coming from. Uh, the editor wants to pull from the documents uh, folder. So now we will 
jump into the library and we will talk about the library. So the library opens, it opens a few more files than the editor. So it opens TXT, HTML, that's the files you find on the web, uh, you know, web pages, uh, docx, word files, PDF, RTF, rich text files, and VRF formats. Now it also, as of the 2.0 update, it also opens unprotected DAISY 2 and DAISY 2.02 and NISO audiobook formats. So you can now play audiobooks, you know, a very specific kind of audiobook and only the unprotected versions. You can find these on Bookshare. Uh, those are all you can play, but it is an option now. And it now includes the ability to copy. So you can copy small selections of text uh, and then paste them uh, into the editor. And by default, as we've discussed, it wants to pull from the books folder. And I'll get to the questions in the chat when we get to our next uh, question about this section. So it has many similarities to the editor. So both apps have auto scroll, basic bookmarking is done the same way, and then text selection and copy are done in the same way. Um, so auto scroll, this is a really useful feature. It's less useful in the editor, it's more useful in the library. But auto scroll just lets it scroll at a set speed so that you don't have to, you can keep your fingers on the braille and you don't have to keep hitting the thumb key to go to the next line. Uh, and it can, it can pair with text to speech in a useful uh, way. So you start auto scroll by pressing enter and then dots one, two, four, five, six. So dots one, two, four, five, six. That is, if you know ASCII braille, that is the right square bracket. And then you increase the auto scroll speed with enter dot six, and you decrease it with enter dot three. So it may take a little bit to find what speed you're comfortable with, but once you get your comfortable speed, it can be a good way to read through books quickly without having to hit the, uh, the thumb keys. So you've got traditional bookmarks, but you've also got what are called highlight bookmarks, which is a neat feature. Um, you, you need to go through, you, you access it with the hotkey enter plus H. And basically you put your cursor at the beginning of your desired passage. You plus enter plus H, that will do the highlight book start. And then you put your cursor at the end of, that, of the passage and do it again, enter plus H. And that will do the, the bookmark end. And this is a really useful way to have just your selections of text. Like you wanna remember this quote or this fact this is a way to have a bookmark set just for that, that part of the text and a quick way to jump between them as well. Uh, easy way to reference them later. And that comes up with advanced navigation. So you can change your navigation level using space plus T. Now navigation, this can be a little confusing. Navigation levels will be based on the file type. So if you're in like a text file, a text file has no markup. And markup means, uh, you know, styles. So it has no headings and things like that. So you can only navigate using page, paragraph, line, sentence. And then once you've added them, you can also navigate using bookmarks. So let's say you've added a ton of bookmarks. You could quickly change your navigation level to bookmark with space plus T repeatedly. And then you can use the thumb keys to navigate from bookmark to bookmark to bookmark. So it's a really great way to study for an exam is set all your bookmarks, use the thumb keys to jump from bookmark to bookmark, and it's a great way to read files. Uh, marked up files are gonna have more options for advanced navigation, like you can navigate by heading or by level, and there's a, there's a lot uh, available there. And finally, uh, here we've got navigation hotkeys. These are just some quick ways to jump through files. There's previous and next paragraph, uh, previous is space plus dots two, three. Uh, next is space plus dots five, six. And then an, a couple more good ones are navigating to the next non-blank line. So this is good if you've got a file that has a lot of empty space in it. Maybe it's got graphics that aren't being reproduced uh, in on your, your single line braille display. So you can do previous non-blank line is enter dot one, 
next non-blank line is enter plus dot four. So a good way to jump through a file. Could we go ahead and launch this next poll question, please? And I'll read it while it's being launched here. This is a true or false. Both the editor and library have bookmarks. And I saw that there were a bunch of questions that came in. Um, can you type in editor and use the terminal connection? So no, not really. We've got a few options. Uh, I don't have time to get into them today. But while you're in the terminal, there is a terminal clipboard. So you can copy and cut things from the editor. And then while you're in the terminal, you can then access those things and paste them. Uh, but you can't use the two apps at the same time. Uh, we've got another question. Software update is not an option listed under settings. How can I find it? Uh, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, in a previous version, um, software update was hidden under, I think, user settings. It's been a really long time. So your device is pretty out of date. You will want to update it. I would recommend you're so out of date. Um, I'm not trying to be offensive, <laughs> but you're so out of date. I would update uh, manually. I would go ahead and go to, <clears throat> excuse me, aph.org and download the update from the Chameleon page and install it manually. Uh, and that, that's a great way to update. And if you run into trouble updating, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we got a folks uh, confused about how to access the apps. <clears throat> the apps are accessed via the main menu. So press the home button while the device is turned on and there's all the apps in a list. And if you run into trouble, you know, feel free to reach out to us at outreach at aph.org and, and we can try to help you out. Is there a printed cheat sheet for all of these hotkeys? And yes, there is. It's available at uh, aph.org slash products slash chameleon dash 20. So the chameleon page. I don't know if any of the folks, um, Aaron or Leslie, if you'd be able to paste the chameleon page in the chat. I'm, I'm not able to access it while I'm sharing but we can get that put in the chat. And I will grab that. Thank you. And then Aaron, have folks been able to access the, or answer the question? Yes, yes. And we had 93% at true. Yes, and true is the correct answer. Um, both the editor and library now have bookmarks. We're doing what we can to try to bring the two apps uh, together into one one app. And part of that was making sure they both have bookmarks. So thank you for that, Aaron. And thank you, Jim, for You're putting the, the shop page in the chat. I really appreciate that. Um, the last app is using the terminal. We've got videos about the terminal that you can access through the APH uh, YouTube page. Um, if it's applicable to the Mantis, uh, it's also true for the chameleon. They both have the same. So there are videos specific just to the mantis, but I recommend checking them out anyway, because they'll still work uh, with the chameleon. Uh, it connects, we've talked about this already, but it connects to Windows computers, Apple devices, uh, so iPads, iPhones, and Chromebooks. Chromebooks are via USB only. Uh, with the other devices, you can use USB or Bluetooth. Uh, on Windows, the screen readers are limited to JAWS and NVDA. Narrator support is in development. Um, and on Apple devices, of course, it's going to use VoiceOver. Now, the most confusing thing about the Bluetooth terminal is discovering your device versus connecting your device. So before you can connect your device, you have to first discover it, OK? So your device has to be discovered. And so that means both your, your, your chameleon and your external device have to be aware of each other before you can connect. And I think what people get confused is they, they do that step and think they should be connected, but you're not gonna automatically connect. Maybe that's something we should change in a future update, but for right now, you first get discovered. And then once you're discovered, then you can connect. So the way to discover is you go to terminal, you go to add Bluetooth device, and then that makes your chameleon discoverable. 
that's basically your chameleon saying out loud to the world, I'm available to connect via Bluetooth. I'm available to connect via Bluetooth. And it'll just keep saying that. Uh, it's a good way to run down your battery if you want to just leave that on uh, for a really long time. But you shouldn't need to. Uh, you should just turn it on. And then on your computer, phone, or tablet, go into your Bluetooth settings and find your chameleon. Sometimes it can take it a second. And sometimes your connection won't work the first time. You know, I've, I've had like, I have some really nice Bluetooth headphones. Uh, I had the same problem with those Bluetooth headphones. It's just kind of one of the things that can happen with Bluetooth. So go ahead and try it. It should connect the first time. If it doesn't connect the first time, just try it again. It should definitely connect the second time. Once you've connected uh, through this discover process, then you can connect in the more meaningful way that lets you use the device um, through the terminal app. So once you've connected, you've made your device discover, discoverable, you've been discovered, then on your chameleon, you wanna make sure it's turned on. You wanna make sure your external device is turned on. And then on your chameleon, go to Bluetooth, go to connected devices, and then find your external device. So the thing you just discovered the chameleon with, find, find it on the chameleon. And it's really helpful to give your external device a clear name. So if you can name your iPad, name it, you know, William's iPad, or name it Jane's iPhone, or name it my PC, name it something that you'll be able to find. You don't want to name it a serial number or something like that, because you'll never be able to find it in that list. Uh, I think this is especially important in your, if you're in a classroom, uh, you want to make sure your devices have clear names. Something we did uh, in the technology department is we gave all of our devices, we named them after trees. And that made it easier, even though, you know, we've got six devices in the room. I know I've got the Oak iPad, so it's easy uh, to connect to, to it that way. Now, Bluetooth tips. Make sure both devices are up to date. There are all the time updates. We're using a new standard called the Braille HID standard. And there are updates all the time that are improving those connections and making them better. So make sure your Chameleon's up to date. Make sure your iPhone, your iPad, your Windows device, your Chromebook, make sure it is up to date. If you ever have trouble connecting, the very first thing you should do is try turning Bluetooth off and on. It's that old trick, you know, turn it off and on, uh, but it works and do that. And then you should be able to connect. If that doesn't work, try forgetting your external device and starting over. So you can go in settings, Bluetooth, delete paired device, and then go to your external device and do the same thing and forget the chameleon and then start the whole process over. You shouldn't have to do that very often, but it does come up on major updates. Like iOS just released iOS 16. On a big update, like going from 15 to 16, it can be useful to completely forget the chameleon, forget the iPhone and start over and repair them. Um, this next thing here is the new quick discover option. So before you had to go through and go through the menus to make your, your chameleon discoverable, the, the method we just talked about. Well, now you can just hold dot eight and it will automatically make your chameleon discoverable. So it's a real easy, quick way to connect your device. And I hope that uh, folks, especially in the classroom, appreciate it and enjoy it and it's useful for you. Uh, you can also go, you can also have your device start automatically in the terminal. If you're not using the local app so much and you're mainly using it with an iPad or an iPhone or something, you can go to settings, user settings, and there's an option to start in terminal. Another option there is to ask it to open USB connection. That one will, as soon as you plug it in via USB, it'll want to connect and it'll say, connect to this or whatever it says, I can't remember. Uh, and it'll, it'll automatically connect to that device. It'll say, do you want to connect to USB terminal? And then the last thing before we run out of time here is a cool, we have a cool terminal feature. It's a real rad feature called quick switch. This is something folks really wanted. So you can connect to multiple devices. You can connect up to five devices via Bluetooth, uh, your iPhones, your iPads, your PCs, and then switch between them. And you use the home plus the next thumb key 
to move forward through this list and home plus the previous to move backward. Now, at the moment, your list isn't configurable. It's just gonna it's just gonna list them in the order you connected them. Uh, most folks are probably only going to be connected to one or two things. So this can be a real easy way to move from your PC back to your phone or from your phone to your iPad. So you've got different options there. Uh, but I, I hope folks find this quick switch useful rather than having to go back to terminal like they used to. And now we've got our last poll question here. Uh, it didn't look like I was going to make it, folks. I didn't think I was going to make it, but we did it. Uh, this is the last poll question. Your chameleon must first be blank before it can be blank. And then your first option is connected, comma, discovered. Your second option is discovered, comma, connected. And now I'll get to the questions. So we've just got one. Uh, can you connect the chameleon to more than one device? We just went over that. So you can do up to five via Bluetooth and one via USB. Uh, does it still work with older operating systems like Windows 8? Uh, it does work with Windows 8. Um, I recommend Windows 10 or later, and it will work with Windows 11. Uh, can you read your PowerPoint notes from a Chameleon Braille display? Yes, you can. Uh, PowerPoint accessibility isn't my expertise. Uh, I do a lot of accessibility testing, but I, I don't tend to test uh, Microsoft software so much, but I know that it can. And if you run into any issues, you can reach out to uh, either outreach at aph.org, cs at aph.org, that's customer service. And then there's also, you can reach out to me at wfreeman at aph.org. And then how are we doing on that poll question? We have 58% answered and- Have we had many responses? We have 33 of our participants who have responded. Like maybe the audio is not, I, mean, I can't hear. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, well, the answer is uh, your chameleon must first be discovered before it can be connected. So just remember, there's the two distinct steps. First, discover your chameleon. And then once you've discovered, then you can connect. And why are thumb keys sometimes referred to as up, down, other times as previous, next, uh, came in the chat? Uh, that's that's my fault. I think of them better as up and down, uh, but the documentation does say previous and next. And just personally, I just prefer to call them up and down. And so that's my fault. And sorry if that's uh, confusing. Uh, and it looks like 69% of folks chose the correct option. And so if we could get the closing code Yes, thank you very much, William. I, I really appreciate everyone uh, attending today. I hope this was useful. I'm sorry if I rushed through it at times, but there will be a video that you can review later. Yes, and I will pause the webinar. Here we go.